God's blessings to you uh, on this Monday, Thursday, as we continue our devotions during this Holy Week at the chapel in the Synod office here in Winnipeg. And we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Monday, Thursday is taken from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, The month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread, and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff on your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is taken from St. John, chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, 
but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments, and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus knew his time was at hand, that he was about to be betrayed, arrested, and suffer. And so he called his disciples to share one last supper with him. St. John in his gospel doesn't give us the details of the supper itself or the institution of the sacrament as the other gospels do. Writing his gospel much later than the others, he assumes his readers already know all about it. In fact, the Lord's Supper was already being practiced according to our Lord's institution by the time John writes his account. The earliest Christians would have already known full well that in the Lord's Supper Jesus gives to us his most precious body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and assures us of everlasting life. That by receiving this gift of grace, their faith would be strengthened. That by partaking in this communion, they would be united with God and with one another. And so St. John focuses his attention on what happens immediately after the supper. He tells of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It's a story that the other gospel writers omit from their account. Matthew, Mark, and Luke jump right into the events of the Garden of Gethsemane. But John doesn't. He fills in the gap, tells the rest of the story of the events in the upper room. And he does so because the story is too important to omit altogether. Now, the significant thing that we need to keep in mind from this text is that Jesus is the host, the master of this supper. This may seem obvious to us, but it's important to note because it was customary for the master to be served, not to serve. That was the job of the servants and the followers. And yet this custom doesn't concern Jesus at all, for he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so after supper, Jesus rose from the table lays aside his outer garment, and ties a towel around his waist. He then fills a basin with water, drops to his knees, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. The disciples are shocked and extremely uncomfortable by the, their Lord's actions. This was highly unorthodox. Foot washing was, of course, a very common practice at this time, yet it was always done before the meal, when the guests first arrive, and was always done by the servants, never the host. It would be considered beneath a man of honor to get on his knees and serve. Likewise, men of honor, particularly those who had disciples, 
would never stoop so low to serve their followers. Rather, it was expected for their followers to cater to the needs of their masters. And so not only was Jesus breaking with tradition and custom, he was switching roles with them. He was acting as the servant and they the masters. This was never done. After all, this was the one they believed to be the very Messiah, the rabbi of rabbis, the master of masters, the one they confessed to be the Son of God in flesh. And here he was, laying aside his honor and majesty, not being concerned with the praise and worship he deserves, but looking to serve, focusing on their needs, caring for them. Jesus here humbles himself in a way that the disciples never witnessed before. And taking on the form of a servant, Jesus begins to wash their feet. And so is it any wonder why the disciples were so shocked, even dismayed to see Jesus humble himself in such a manner, serving and caring for them, washing and drying their feet. They felt they should be the ones serving him, not the other way around. This just didn't seem right. It felt too unnatural, which as we read prompts Peter to speak out against it. He first questions Jesus saying, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus knowing Peter's confusion answers, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. This however doesn't satisfy Peter he objects to the idea of Jesus serving him. And so he says to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. Now Peter is not trying to be defiant. He's attempting to be pious and devout. He thinks he's doing Jesus a favor here. He thinks Jesus is far too holy to stoop down to serve him. In his mind, God should never be the one serving, but should be served. And because Peter believes this way, he doesn't yet understand Jesus. He doesn't yet grasp why the Son of God took on flesh and became fully man, why he came into the world, why he instituted the Lord's Supper, and why he keeps talking about having to suffer and die. Peter doesn't get any of this because at this point, he's all about the law focusing on what we must do to please God. His focus is entirely on serving, striving to please God with his gifts and talents in order for God to find him worthy and faithful. And here God in the flesh is turning the tables on that way of thinking, explaining to Peter and to all of us that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. This certainly applies to Peter. It was unnatural for him to conceive of God serving him. And the same holds true for us. We too find it unnatural, which is why we naturally resort to focusing solely on the law on our works of righteousness, our service, what we need to do to please God to earn his favor. Failing to recognize, as Peter did, that it is not God who needs our service, but we poor miserable sinners desperately need God to serve us, to wash us clean of the guilt of our sin. For as our Lord says to Peter and to all of us, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. As our Lord teaches us here, in order for us to have a share in his kingdom, to have communion with God, then he must serve us. He must lower himself to the filth of our sin in order to cleanse us of it, to give his life as a ransom for many by humbly sacrificing himself for us, by freely journeying to the cross on our behalf and dying in our place and laying aside his outer garment, falling to his knees, and washing his disciples' feet, illustrates our Lord laying down everything, even his own life, for us. 
as St. John writes at the beginning of this narrative, Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, loved them to the end. We see true love here, sacrificial love, the love that led him to lay down his life for his friends, the undeserved love that led him to die for us sinners. Jesus shows us what true love is all about, how it's expressed. It's expressed in serving, especially those unworthy of it. And it's expressed in self-sacrifice. Jesus freely shows us this love and calls on us to have and share that love with one another. Yet he also tells us that apart from him, we can do nothing that we are incapable of having and expressing this love without first His love, filling us with love. Which is why He institutes the Lord's Supper. Why out of love He gives to us His most precious body and blood. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper to intimately unite us to Himself, to not only bless us with the forgiveness He won for us on the cross and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but to also abide within us, allowing us to participate, partake in his divine nature, filling our hearts with his love so that we may love one another as he loves us. In so doing, Jesus continues to serve us. Out of sacrificial love, he removes the outer garment of his heavenly majesty, kneeling down before us, by sacramentally uniting his body and blood to simple bread and wine and serving us with it, all out of love, to give us his love so that we may experience and share his love. It's an expression and gift of love that I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead you to yearn for, particularly during these difficult times when the sacrament may not be easily accessible and you may have to wait for it. And so I pray that when you are able to receive this most blessed gift, you run to it, fall down on your knees before the altar of the Lord, and allow Jesus to serve you with this gift of love that unites you to him and to all the disciples around the world that commune with us. May his love fill us with love, that we may love one another. Amen. Let us pray. Grant to us zeal for your house, O Lord, and love for the things of your kingdom, that your church may enjoy harmony and peace and confess your word with one voice before the world. Cover us with the blood of Christ and grant us your spirit, that we may walk in your ways and do the good you desire, loving one another as you have called us to do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless, O Lord, as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus to the cross. Help us to ponder well the love he has shown us by his suffering and death, and make us so confident of the resurrection to everlasting life, that this supper may fulfill the Passover promise and feed us upon the foretaste of the eternal feast to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all those whom you have called and gathered by your Spirit through your Word into your holy church around the world. We implore you to put an end to the COVID-19 virus epidemic that is afflicting the world. Bring healing to those suffering from it and grant your peace and comfort to those in fear and those mourning the death of loved ones. Watch over and protect your servants around the world that they may continue to deliver your life-giving word and sacraments to the members of your church and shine the light of your Son and his gospel into the darkness of our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You know, O Lord, what we need, and you have promised never to abandon us. Help us to endure in faith and with a joyful countenance receive the blessings of your grace and the answers to our prayers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
Amen.